I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. We're continuing our conversation with Robert Egger. Let me ask you about, we had a question come, come to us from a viewer who wanted to know how to improve school kitchens, that whole world of food for our children. Wow, I tell you. You know, I was visiting um, my parents in rural Indiana, and I was vexed that the 60 cities that built kitchens like ours were all outgrowing their bases and building new kitchens, and it's just a lot of money to build a kitchen. And I was thinking about that, and all of a sudden I looked at this high school. Just, I just was a stoplight, and it's like, and it was like a eureka moment, because there's 60,000 school cafeterias in America. Um, and they're full of kids who have to get service to graduate. Yet we still say, leave school and come to the DC Central Kitchen. Oftentimes saying, come to the city, you know, which just reinforces kind of dopey stereotypes. So this opened up an amazing doorway. And something, we actually have a kitchen like this up in Spokane at Gonzaga, and we're talking to different universities here. What an amazing resource. Because um, at its best, the discussions we're having about better school food, great discussion, important discussion, but it's still saying, we're still talking about literally gas, better gas in a gas station. And I'm not interested in a gas station. To me, cafeterias are the best classroom we have because I'll be honest with you, I'm not an analytical learner. I, for me, math out of a book was physically, mentally impossible. And my daughter was similar, and she was struggling with fractions. And we went out and got a couple of baking cups and makes, basically, in making a cake, explored fractions. So I really started thinking about the idea, of, wow, school cafeterias, not only could you potentially source locally to, to make better school foods, and we're doing this experiment in Washington, but the idea of the, the school cafeterias is learning labs where again, math, science, history, nutrition. But take it a step further. Um, I mentioned uh, in, our, in our taping about Meals on Wheels. You know, um, at one level, while I want to explore how we value our elders in America, we do have to think about a system that will basically supplement or and sometimes actually replace Meals on Wheels. So the idea of kids coming down and doing after school service in the cafeteria using locally stored stuff to make Meals on Wheels. Another group may be delivering, but again, the old model says we feed kids here and seniors here. The future is intergenerational. So this idea of seniors who, as a country, we, it's essential that we have our elders engaged and living at home as long as possible. So vibrant volunteer activity is huge. So that idea of seniors coming up and mentoring after school or doing after school projects together, gardens, whatnot. But take it a step further. I mentioned earlier that, that face of hunger is a single mom who's running all over town trying to drop kids off, get to work, pick up kids, um, the idea of meals to go. Imagine kids at school in a cooking club producing meals to go for working for anybody. But the idea of saying to a mom, instead of having to choose between time and just picking up something fast on the way home and picking up something that not only do their kids make, that not only supports a local farmer and not only is healthy and, and affordable, but the revenue goes to allow the school that might have had budget cuts to rehire a music instructor or an art instructor. So, so many schools, though, have gone to a central kitchen where the, there's actually not a kitchen left at the actual school building. It's right. just a place to serve, to, to reheat and serve. There is a dynamic of, of, and again, this is kind of the clumsy nature of you know the pendulum we go through where it's like, I, I still believe that there are functions for a central facility, you know, but there are ways to re-explore within schools maybe a, a re, repurposing school cafeterias. Like I said, when we were young, girls were sent to home ec, and, and boys, and particularly boys who they thought were gonna be trouble, went to shop. You know, and, and in effect, there was a moment in the 1990s where we said, in effect, no, every kid needs to go to college. We're not gonna force women to think of themselves as, as you know, homemakers, and, and we want everybody to go to college. And I think we left behind a really viable um, learning tool. And I think, quite frankly, and you're seeing this in universities all over America, is people wanna learn to cook. This is something very unique, whether it's kind of a social interest in communing again, or whether it's creating affordable meals that allow you on maybe a smaller uh, you know, um, income to eat healthy. And for a lot of older people, they are gonna be wildly aware of the role that nutrition plays in the longevity and the vitality they have in their older years. So at so many different levels, whether it's at a high school, a community college in a rural community. And that's another thing, I had a great conversation with the local food bank. One of the, one of the most amazing existing resources we have in America is the extension system that goes out from the land grant universities. So the idea of, of what the model I'm interested in, one small, but the idea of a campus kitchen, which is what we call it a land grant, but then students actually using extensions so that at the community college and in the, in the rural communities, that school cafeteria can become much more than just a filling station. It can be a vibrant, again, learning lab, but also a revenue generator and a place where we can help kids learn 
how not how so much of our education is about how do you get a job, and I think we need to start teaching kids how to create a job, and that 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 wild doorway that a cafeteria could open to how you can use locally grown produce to make money, but not just money for yourself, but something that makes the community better. Again, that idea of when I go to work, I go to work in the basement of the biggest shelter in America, and by by for many people's standards, that would be a, a pretty heinous place to make a living. But I, I'm, I'm mesmerized by the energy we're able to eke out of these four walls because it's so much more than meals we produce. Again, you know, 14,000 volunteers come in, and if we do our job right, they have this really, this eureka moment about the sense of like, I worked side by side. You know, we just had the president of the first family come in last week, and we've been lucky. We've had a few visits over the years by different presidents. And the power of the kitchen is there's a president of the United States working side by side with someone out of a drug treatment program. You know, and, and in effect, it's, it's saying we're all residents of Washington, D.C. You know, no matter how smart you are or no matter how checkered your past, everybody has a role. You know, this era in which the poor were served by the people with jobs, the old model, I just, it, it's historic. It just doesn't work. So I'm more intrigued by the idea of bringing everybody around to the same side of the table and say, let us put our heads together, work together, and reveal how rich our community really is. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was food banks or kitchens on campus. Originally, you said that was, a, that was an area where people said, well, these are the undeserving poor, these students getting food. But they really are hungry students on campus. Yeah, my daughter came home talking about friends of hers going to the food bank, and my first reaction was like, you know, the, uh, well, it, it wasn't printable, let's put it that way. I just felt like, again, this was an exploitative situation. But I got to tell you, I was down in Tennessee, and I went to a college, and they talked about either young men and women who are here on grants or, or scholarships, but the scholarship sco covers tuition, not food. Right. Working moms, particularly at community colleges, who are trying to get some skills so they can get out of what might be a service job into something more, but again, who are trying to scrimp every penny they have. So I must admit I had to call my daughter and apologize because I realized that, again, I'll be honest, when I first started the kitchen, I thought homelessness, hunger was about homelessness. And even 23 years in, I'm still learning the extent of hunger in America. Um, most people in America are, are decent, kind people, but for better or worse, we, for many people, the, 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 the comfort zone is if you're, if you're hungry, it's your fault. You know, if you're in prison, you deserve it. If you're poor, you're lazy. And, and I was you know, like that. There was a sense of I, I held on tight to that, that stereotype. And it's very difficult sometimes to let people get, let go of that because it's, that, it gives you comfort that everything's kind of okay, the world you grew up it's thinking. Fair. It's fair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fair and just. So I'm constantly, even in my own mind, I'm still learning. That's why I love coming to Idaho. It's my first time here. Uh, and I love the state, by the way. But again, every place I go, I go with this idea of I have a lot of things that I've learned, but boy, I can, I can learn more every day. So how can we do business together? All right. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate you joining us yeah, for this. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. pleasure, yeah. And thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on our Dialogue Web Extra.